All right, guys, welcome. Welcome to the final exam. Um, I hope uh, this video finds everybody well. Um, I want to make some general comments about the course, and um, then I will jump into the instructions for the exam and uh, jump into the questions themselves. And uh, also, I will point out uh, and remind everybody the relevant videos and PowerPoints where uh, you can you can find uh, information pertaining to a lot of these questions. Um, so this has certainly been uh, an interesting and unusual semester. Um, I uh, I certainly hope that uh, everyone is doing as well as they can under uh, these trying circumstances. Um, even for those people who don't have any issues with uh, a loved one near them who uh, is sick or has passed away or is themselves sick, there's so there's been so many uh, unforeseen consequences. I mean, who who could imagine uh, anything like this? Um, so uh, I really uh, wish you all the best, and um, I just want to say that um, I I feel um, you know really it's. Uh, make the most of it, but it is really unfortunate um, that, uh, you know, the middle of the semester is like that moment where I'm getting to know everyone and, uh, I'm, like, students are, you know, they know what the class is and they, they know what the format is and they have something about what my approach is and so on. And um, it really becomes interesting and we kind of settle in in a comfortable way. And uh, to have everything disrupted like this is um, is uh, is is just unfortunate and sad, um, and t too bad. But um, uh, you know, I also just want to make some some general uh, apologies about not getting my videos up as fast as I would have liked, and there was some lag time with with the exa uh, the um, the uh, assignments, obviously. Um, really wasn't entirely necessary that you see everything uh, before you do the assignment. In fact, um, uh, I think it's actually important to try to answer those questions in, in some cases with without having uh, access to all the lecture. And obviously your answers would change, but um, part of those questions is uh, to make you have a kind of college try at these texts, your first crack at them, like what what is your reaction, and to kind of throw you into the wilderness or throw you to the lions, right? I I kind of you probably might not always find that so satisfying, but I think for me it's important to to do for students. Um, that said, I mean I I have never produced videos like this on anything like a regular basis. I just fiddled around with things. I had a lot of videos to produce. I only had so much memory on my computer. And I discovered, like, as I was doing this, all the troubleshooting that occurred and uh, encountering kind of different types of problems on a daily basis and figuring out how to solve them in an expeditious way. And, um, uh, you know, I, I tried to compose these videos as, as nicely as I could under the time pressures were were in and in some cases I don't actually have my course materials before me and I had to like dig up texts and I I didn't have everything with me because I'm no longer in New York for the time being because of the because of the complications from the the coronavirus um that said um a couple things one thing I would really like to do uh as a kind of exit assignment that's a little like low hanging fruit that's like an easy get points for for very little is uh, I'm really concerned and interested to have students feedback on uh what you read and what you thought was interesting what you thought was challenging what you thought um maybe you didn't get as much as you would have liked or you or there was something that you came to the course a course on frenemies a course on friendship and you said, hmm, this this is what I think, you know, we must be doing something like this um, or reading something like this. Um, but you didn't get that. I'd be curious for for uh, your your feedback on that. Um, and I would I'm going to turn that into a little uh, discussion board assignment. And it'll be, 
it'll be like a five ten minute assignment and uh, basically kind of free points but also really important feedback um for me um a professor keep this in mind when people stand before you uh claiming you know absolute knowledge uh and infallibility a professor or a teacher is just a student who spent more time studying what you're studying than you have right um so i'm a student too and um it's part of my obligation as a, a higher level student to want to continue to develop the, my course develop my ideas and um you do your best as a professor to try to gauge the reaction that you're going to have like so for example i i have a sense of what text students get more excited by and more interested in because they're written a certain way or because of the topics or because of the characters or something like that. And I definitely am aware that, you know, some texts are going to be naturally more magnetic than others. I, I think, you know, my, my impression is um, Ar Aristotle is a, is a challenge, although I find a lot of students really uh, are fascinated by that challenge and intrigued by some of the questions and issues he raised uh, raises about our own happiness and, and what really matters. Um, but but you never you never assume you know as a professor exactly how you know it's like a comedian how does your joke how did your joke go over with the audience um you never know cuz in in comedy people laugh but in uh you know in, in a classroom someone could sit there and not say anything and that could mean that they're having the best time of their life just soaking it in or it means they they just like this isn't for me pal Right. So you never you never know what that reaction means. Um, OK, so last thing before I turn to the exam um, is this. That if you wanted to have a successful exam, you really must watch the videos and look at the PowerPoints I've posted to this point. I mean, one thing I should say is I have done a substantial amount of of work that uh, I wouldn't have otherwise done because of this online context. And I've uh, put together things that, I mean, in fact, the amount of video I've given you, as some of you are probably, um, you know, aware in a in maybe not a thrilled way, I've given you a lot more video than we actually would have had class time, two, two days a week. So I have really tried to give you uh, everything I can and uh, it allowed me to really go into these texts and get to the things that are, are really interesting. But in terms of the success on the exam, obviously it's not like you go over every single video, but uh, the videos that pertain to the answers on the exam, it is absolutely necessary if you want to succeed um, that you look at those PowerPoints and that you uh, look at those uh, videos. And I think, you know, because the PowerPoints are part of the video lecture, I, I don't think there's anything in those PowerPoints that I didn't go at some point into great detail to explain at least what we needed to know for our purposes in understanding a given text or a given concept uh, or something of that kind. Okay, so let's look at the midterm. Excuse me, the final exam. All right, so just to be really patently clear, it's been up for a while, but just to be 100% on top of things, you scroll, we're, we're of course in assignments here, right here. You scroll down and you've got the final exam. I think most everybody has long since been aware of this because I posted it a while ago. So you click on it. And here you've got the Word document with the instructions and the questions. And here you've got uh, the um, turn it in function, which you need to use a, a document format that works with turn it in, and they accept a bunch of them. Um, but I would really prefer you just use, uh, ideally, if you're able to, uh, some uh, a word document or a word processing format that is uh, pretty common, or you or you could do obviously PDF, right? Um, Next thing, you see the due date, 11.59 on Sunday, May 24. So obviously there's a handful, it's not, it's smaller than I would have expected, but there's a handful of students who have had issues because life creates issues and this situation has created issues. If you, and so the point is, if you have an issue, I understand, 
right? Let me be very clear. If you have an issue, I understand. But your obligation is to get in touch with me sufficiently prior to the final due date to say that you need more time. And I will provide you that time. One of the issues at this point is that I have to get my grades in by the beginning of June. And I, I, will, I will look up the exact date uh, in the next day or two and just mention that to everyone. So part of the problem is, in terms of the due date, is I, I am going to be running out of time and under pressure to get my grades in. And part of me pressuring you uh, for a hard deadline is because I have a hard deadline and I do not have the luxury of submitting grades late like that's just the school doesn't accept it and I, I don't want to be in I can't be in the position uh, of doing that um, nonetheless as issues arise we're gonna find accommodations for those who need them full stop I'm gonna find a way to make it work however uh, not so much in terms of the final exam, but the final grade. I will not be giving incompletes to students who have not gotten in touch with me to let me know what their situation is. So if you're off the radar completely, um, uh, there is nothing I can do. If you get in touch with me and let me know, uh, and an incomplete is only for students who have severe situations and really have kind of uh, serious kind of existential life things that uh, are totally unexpected and obviously this circumstance is exactly um, you know potentially what that that grade is designed for to be fair to people who have those kind of issues arise full stop but uh, to be fair in in granting that status requires that people do their due diligence get in touch with me let me know what's going on so we that is if you get an incomplete that is because we have reached an agreement with each other myself and you the student that that is what's happening given what you've told me about your situation now you don't need to tell me everything but i need to know enough to know that this is a real situation and it's serious and um and you know that that's just an obligation to be fair to students who turning things in on time for example so that that's always a challenge as a professor negotiating uh, th those issues and to be fair to people who do get everything on time and also be fair to people who couldn't possibly have gotten things in on time for th for issues that are not, no no fault of their own okay so I think everybody understands uh, you know people had some issues apparently uh, submitting uh, to turn it in let, let's be very clear. You can only turn in one document on Turnitin. Once you've turned in your document, you can't add anything else. So you must put your exam into one document. Um, do not put your questions into two separate documents. Honestly, I don't know why you would do that in the first place. Um, uh, it's all it's all one thing. And to turn it in, you can only submit one document. And one, once you've done that on your end, you're, you're stuck with it right so um, I, I am able to actually tweak things on my end because I can control the the file that's on there but um, so just just keep that in mind because some people turned in like a, the question one from the midterm and then they had to submit the rest of it to me via email I do not want your exam I let, can, let me can I say this a little bit humorously I do not want your exams via email I want them through turn it in that's where it belongs and you know what? This is like a collating issue. If I have exams here, there, and everywhere else, it just becomes a big problem um, of tracking everything down. And a tremendous amount of time can be uh, used up or, um, as the case may be, wasted doing stuff like that. There may be rare exceptions. Understood. But uh, every this, this uh, Turnitin is very simple. You upload a document like you upload things on a million other uh, types of applications and sites. Okay, so let's go to the exam itself. Dun dun dun. Let me just uh, square this up. Okay, move myself out of the way here. 
All right, so let's do it at 11.59. I've just talked about the lateness policy. Make sure your name is on it. Um, it should be a Word document, ideally 12 font, one and a half spaced, right? Please don't play games with the font, with the spacing, with the margins, uh, because the two-page limit is based on those, those, those uh, settings, right? Um, the final exam format is exactly the same as the midterm, is exactly the same as the midterm. So let me first say, leave the instructions in as you work so you can refer back to them. They are helpful. I wrote these for you, right? Um, and they offer little reminders that uh, once you start editing are important to come back to. And I'm going to go over these uh, briefly and then we're going to move on to the questions. The next thing is leave the questions in. I'm giving you, you have two essay questions. You're not writing one continuous essay from beginning to end. You're writing one essay for one question and another essay for the other question. And at the beginning of the first essay, you have the question intact. and the beginning of the second, you have the, the question left there. The two-page limit is based on your answer. It does not include the question or anything other than your answer, right? Why am I asking you to leave the question in there? So you can use it as a reference point to refer back to. And I will say unequivocally, in my years of giving an exam of this format, that students who leave the question in do better because almost always, on the whole, they answer the question more directly because they have it sitting there in front of them. Right? <coughs> Next thing. If you want to break the parts of the question down and use them as an outline for your answer, by all means, I am encouraging you to do that as part of establishing the order, the structure of the essay. However, when you finish your essay, you, I want you to only have the full question at the beginning followed by the full answer without that answer being broken up and without that answer being continued into the next essay because that's a separate essay, right? Um, so I had some people on the midterm just like they gave me four pages of a continuous just writing and there was no there was no clarity of the question being answered there was no clarity uh, of where one began and one ended uh, and so on and so forth you were obviously writing in sentence paragraph form and the primary concern here uh, is uh, is uh, the intelligibility and the logical structure of your writing right uh, Ernst Hemingway says the first draft of everything is shit. The first draft of everything ends up in the vertical file, which we all know the vertical file is the trash can. Why? Because nobody writes intuitively off the top of their head uh, in perfect uh, essay form prose, right? It just does not happen. Uh, good writing comes from good editing. Let me say it again good writing comes from good editing and the best writing comes from I would say the most persistent editing and it's really when you have finished doing all this and hashing out the ideas that's just the prologue the real writing is reading the crap you've written I hate to say it it's reading the crap you've written right because then you go oh my god I wrote this, I said this, I don't know what that means. Why is this here? Why is that there? I don't know. Well, maybe it needs to be changed, right? So all these things, it's when you read your own writing that you realize what it needs. And uh, you can only do that once you finish writing and you just go back and read it. Um, what does this sentence mean? I don't know. Well, I better clarify that. Uh, and. Uh, a key aspect of uh, what I'm asking for is that you stay as close to the text as possible. When I say uh, stay close to the text, it means I want you to avoid as much. It cannot be completely avoided. So if you're if you have a thesis statement, a thesis statement is a certain type of generalization, right? Um, what is the meaning of Aristotle's concept of self-love? Well, to initiate that answer, you need to start out with a reasonably general claim, right? 
even the even that in making a general claim, you can still get a lot of specifics in that general overarching claim, which is going to be filled out by all the details. However, when I say clo stay close to the text, it means in writing about what your topic is, or what the question is, you need to give the particulars and the substance of the text in the most specific way you can, right? To, to, to show a kind of real familiarity with with what's there right and of course this ties into answering the question directly right it's not enough to say true things about the text it's not enough to say oh Aristotle was born many years ago and he's a famous philosopher that's not relevant to any of these questions right and then the next aspect of you know that's one dealing with one sentence is the next aspect is the logical flow of sentences I often find that when I write, uh, I have, say, five sentences in a paragraph, right? And I'm like, man, every sentence here is actually really good. Like, each one is coherent. It snaps to the point. Um, it, it has a punch. It's like it's, a, it's a, an insightful point. It's not just some kind of uh, ge 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 generic statement. And... Um, but then I look at it and said, wow, it turns out like three of these sentences don't even belong. They, this one doesn't belong here. This one belongs in the paragraph up here because it turns out this really isn't about what the rest of the paragraph is about, even though it's a good sentence. And it, it actually does have a kind of a connection. But the real connection is this paragraph. Oh, this sentence needs to go down here. Uh, or then I go like, you know, what is the real topic of this paragraph? And when I clarify that, I realize, oh, this this sentence needs to go here because this is really the dominant theme of this paragraph and this point here is good but it's really a subordinate theme right so this is what editing really is it's not turning on the grammar and spelling function of uh, Microsoft Word and going through the document and sifting out all those little errors it's only something you can do right uh, so lastly, as I finish up grading the midterm, so one, one thing I really see is um, you need to cite from the text. You need to cite from the text. You need to cite from the text. You need to cite from the text, right? Crucially important, uh, a central part of your grade. And, of course, that's part of staying close to the text, uh, paraphrasing from the text and quoting directly from the text and when you do that you need to just cite the page number because we already know the text we're talking about we're not writing a research paper uh, it's informal so absolutely important that you cite from the text and um, let's be clear um, I have presented in the PowerPoints excerpts of the text which is where you might find some of the central answers to the questions being asked nudge nudge wink wink uh, right, so I've I've done I, I I I've led you to the water and you have to drink it, right? It's for you to drink because I'm not the one who's thirsty. Uh, you are. Uh, why would I drink water when I'm not thirsty? I don't know. Um, so, uh, what's the last thing I wanted to to remind here? Um, really important. This is not a research paper, right? This is your analysis uh, of these texts in response to these questions about these texts. What do you think the text means? Right? That's, in, in essence, what I'm asking you, and I'm asking you that about specific uh, things. Right? This is not a research paper where you read a bunch of interpretations of a primary source and then synthesize them and cite them. Right? So there should be no use of secondary literature whatsoever. Furthermore, there should be no cutting and pasting from the internet without attribution. First of all, that would constitute a secondary source. And second of all, that's plagiarism. And plagiarism, you will fail uh, your uh, exam if you plagiarize. And the Turnitin function um, helps me address that. And I also, I just have, I can see it uh, all the time when a passage just doesn't sound like uh, a student at a certain point. Um, and it's very simple to get proof in the Internet age because I have this thing called the Internet at home myself and I Google. I have a thing called Google and I Google 
you know, say five words in a row, and then I can bring it up. And I think the biggest disappointment for me is not just that it's cheating and it's dishonest, but like, uh, I actually want to know what you have to think about what's being written. And some of these texts are really challenging, and I understand that. But, you know, in, in all sincerity, I the, the challenging texts I've given you are some of the seminal works uh, in um, the university. they taught in different departments for different reasons. This is uh, the, the, some of the great legacy of, of Western thinking. And um, I have an obligation to expose you to these things and to elevate, to elevate beyond um, the hustle and bustle of, uh, of everyday life. So they're challenging, but my concern is I want you to have an opinion. I want you to have an opinion about them. And just get, get this so it doesn't click. Like, all right, there we go. All right, so let's be clear. Uh, the exam consists of answering two questions, two pages each, for a total of four pages of answers. Part one is a mandatory question. You must answer this question. Part two, I'm giving you two questions. I want you to choose one of them. So the first one's mandatory, and the second, you choose between two, you choose one, so that's for a total of two questions. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> part one, explain the two notions of self-love presented by Aristotle in Book 9 of the Nicomachean Ethics and Rousseau's Discourses on the Origins of Inequality. Okay, so let me first say that these issues are dealt with at great length uh, and also f simplicity uh, in the PowerPoints I've provided and the lectures that deal with them. Um, so let's just remember, uh, Aristotle's book nine is the last book we looked at. We looked at on friendship eight and nine, and nine was the last book we looked at. So I think it's just about the last lecture uh, on uh, the Nicomachean Ethics deals with this theme of self-love. And the important thing is both Aristotle and Rousseau have two concepts of self-love. Um, Aristotle calls one self-love, and then he calls the other, he's like self-lovers, and it's really a form of kind of narcissism. Uh, Rousseau has a mot de soi-même and a mot propre. And we looked at actually the note, on, I think it's page 218 of the second discourse, in which he actually just defines these terms right there and then. Um, so, and he actually uses these French terms. Now, in the text throughout, he tends to use the word uh, van, or it, rather, I should say, the translator uses the word vanity to translate a mopop, and the word self-love to describe a mot de soi-même. So both both uh, thinkers, philosophers, political thinkers, uh, social scientists, whatever you want to call them, uh, both of them have a positive and negative concept of self-love. And in many ways, their positive concepts are similar and their negative concepts are similar. And let me just give you one insight into the important difference between these two. And it has to do with the difference in the role of reason in human life, in human action, uh, in human nature, and in self-love. So as we know, as we should all know, in, Rus in Aristotle, pardon me, in Aristotle, Reason is the fundamental element of the soul that provides for an orderly and happy uh, 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 life, uh, which is to say a life of virtue uh, that achieves happiness as its goal. For Aristotle, there is no virtue, there is no happiness without the best use of our reason. The basic use, but also the best use. Uh, for Aristotle, we are the rational animal right? For Rousseau, reason, what is the second discourse? The second discourse is the discourse on the inequality, inequality, and it is uh, basically a kind of origin story of the origins and development of inequality in society. And he pins the blame 
of a substantial portion of the problem of the origins of inequality on our use of reason. So Aristotle has a, in general, a very positive conception of reason or understanding of it. And Rousseau, in many ways, not in, not in all ways, but in many ways has a negative view of the role of reason in human society. For Aristotle, our use of reason is what civilizes us and makes us excellent. For Rousseau, our reason has corrupted us and ruined us from our better state. And Rousseau uh, acknowledges that we're a being that has reason, but he, he sees that the primary uh, element in our psychology, in, in our soul, that is of the greatest value from his point of view, are our passions. And not any passions, our natural passions are uh, passions that are untinctured by the, the ideas of merit of society, ideas of merit and beauty and worth, and, uh, and untinctured by, by reason's distorting effects. Something like our natural impulses, like the kind of impulses a young child, or in his case, the, 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 the savage in the state of nature have. So in distinguishing the good and bad versions, it has a lot to do with the relative role of reason versus the relative role of sentiment. So part two, you choose one. So the first question, they both deal with Orwell's 1984. So the world of Orwell's 1984 is often described as totalitarian. Uh, what does it mean for a political regime to be totalitarian? So if you look at the PowerPoint, you look at the video, I gave you a very clear uh, general definition of totalitarianism. And then I gave you some specific examples and specific uh, elements in 1984 that are indicative of a totalitarian society. Uh, and I give you a little bit here, just to set you on your way. In the simplest definition of a totalitarian regime, it's one that exercises total or close to total control over all aspects of the lives of its citizens. Describe some of the techniques used to control citizens in the world of 1984. So, what are some of the techniques used to control citizens in the world of 1984? Answer, there are a lot of them, and many of them I talk about. Uh, the, the central ones uh, I talk about, uh, they're established in the PowerPoint and they're in the lectures. Uh, and also, um, you could turn to almost any page of that book and find some example of a strategy this society uses to control its citizens. Uh, as we have seen in the symposium, one of the basic strategies of tyranny or totalitarianism is divide and conquer divide and conquer the people in their relationships to themselves and to one another. How does this strategy work, and how is it evident in 1984? <laughs> so, in the last lecture, uh, we talked about uh, 1984 as a love story, and it talked about the way in which part of the strategy of the society is to undermine the intimate relationships between human beings and there's a specific discussion of marriage and there's, spe there's a specific discussion uh, in the passages I read uh, of just how the regime tries to control intimate relations between men and women, married relations, conjugal relations, and even control over the way they think about sex and their own relationship to the psychology of sex. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Do you like Rousseau, uh, Rousseau's description of society? A major form of control is through language and ideas. So if you remember, Rousseau said, you know, ultimately that what makes man happy is being in his natural condition, which is natural feelings. And the corruption happens when we are forced to subscribe to concepts or ideas of merit and beauty that we're forced to live up to in order to get by in society. And we start, we're forced to live up to standards that are not in conformity with our own natural inclinations, our natural faculties, 
our des natural desires, abilities, etc., and that makes us unhappy, right? Um, in fact, it turns out that 1984 really functions on the very same set of principles. Um, language, this comes in the form of newspeak. So this leads into the last part of D. What is newspeak and how is it used as a form of speech and thought uh, as a strategy of control to divide and conquer the people? What is doublethink and how is it part of this strategy? So newspeak is a form of speaking that has a specific goal of controlling the citizens. And actually newspeak, when you use it, it just results in doublethink because the, the very meaning of newspeak words uh, uh, exhibit this um, feature of uh, doublethink. Lastly, so, you know, these two questions are over, they have some overlap to them, but since you're only choosing one, you do one or the other, right? Uh, so one principle of the world of Orwell's 84 is called panopticonism. Discuss the role of surveillance and lack of privacy in Orwell's 1984 as a means of control. Give specific examples and explain how they work. So in the PowerPoint and in the video, I have a segment that deals with the concept of panopticonism, right? And uh, panoptic to understand panopticonism, you have to have a little understanding, which I provide, of what a panopticon is. So what is a panopticon and how does it relate to the world of 1984? What is panopticonism and how, uh, does, it how does it illustrate how is it illustrated in Rousseau's Second Discourse? Explain how panopticonism works in 1984 and some of the techniques used to produce it. So the panopticon, panopticonism has to do with surveillance, monitoring people. And so the, the basic point is the way in which these citizens in 1984 are monitored is a mechanism of controlling them. And the question really becomes, how is it that by monitoring them, you are really able to control them? The, the, the two don't obviously go together, if you think about it. And really the answer is the way in which they're able to control them is through this thing, this phenomenon called panopticonism, um, which is on display in the text. Excuse me. Uh, C. Discuss how this strategy of control relates to the ring of Gyges. Uh, how excuse me, how is the regime, how is the regime and its actions invisible or concealed from the people, uh, allowing, allow it, uh, how are the regimes and its actions uh, invisible or concealed from the people, allowing it to better control them. So, Gaiji's works in, is, is the story of this character who has a ring that makes him invisible, right? We all know that. And when it makes him invisible, uh, it allows him to do things uh, that he wouldn't otherwise be able to do and get away with it because he's uh, not around to get caught uh, and suffer the consequences because he's invisible, right? So this regime uh, functions itself on a certain invisibility. And this is, in a sense, kind of the inverse to uh, the surveillance. Just as the people are highly visible to the regime because they can always see them, through the telescreen, right? Um, I didn't say that. That's not an answer. Um, uh, likewise, the regime is largely invisible to the people. They don't know how it works. They don't really know who's in charge. They don't know its structure, right? They're left in the dark, and that actually becomes a form of control. <coughs> okay, so uh, D... If the myth of Gyges illustrates how concealment is a form of power which allows individuals or states, societies, to do what they want, it also illustrates the inverse, how transparency, exposure, or surveillance weakens individuals and prevents them uh, from what they want to do. So there, it's not exactly phrased as a question, um, but what I'm trying to highlight here is something coming out of C. Um, you know, 
how does the transparency of the citizens' lives in eighty four in nineteen eighty four lead to their uh, control and leave them in a state of vulnerability uh, to being controlled? Okay, so I think that's a pretty robust discussion. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out and ask them uh, about any any of these. Um, if you want me to look at a draft, I'm happy to look at a draft. So please, excuse me, feel free to send that to send that to me. Um, and please just do it in, in a sufficient advance time to the due date, so we can so we can uh, uh, so I can get it back to you with with some good feedback. Okay, so uh, have a great day and uh, good luck on the final exam. Thank you very much, guys.